All right, welcome back to Learn SDR with Prof. Jason. Last time we talked about how to lock a constellation onto the right points, but it ends up locking onto an arbitrary point. Whatever happens to be nearest or whatever happens to, to uh, end up finally locking. And so for a binary phase shift keying where we're sending plus ones and minus ones, we, we might end up getting the plus ones and minus ones out, or we might end up getting minus ones and plus ones out. And we need some way of dealing with that. And for the quadrature phase shift keying where there's four different points, we might get any of those four rotations. It might lock onto any of those four rotations. So um, it, it'll just sort of lock to the nearest 90 degree rotation, not necessarily the one you, you need. So, and there's no way to resolve this, this ambiguity without doing something with the data or looking at the data. And this is why I've avoided really looking at the data that comes out of this un until, until now. So there are two techniques to deal with, to deal with this. So technique number one is to send, send a known unique word. So this is typically done in, in packet communication where as part of the start of the transmission, you send a pretty long uh, sequence of symbols that's, that's well known to all the receivers. And uh, hopefully it also contains a lot of transitions so that the, the timing, uh, uh, timing synchronizer can, can lock onto it. And then it, uh, the Costas loop will lock and you'll get the, the phase locked. And then you'll just look at what comes out and you'll say, okay, which one of these, it, it, did I get my unique word or did I get the, the sign flip of that unique word for binary phase shift key? Or for a more complicated constellation, did I get my word out or did I get one of the possible uh, rotations of that word out. Um, that, that's actually the, the, best, uh, the best way to go if, if, you have, uh, if, you're, if you're doing something like packet data. Uh, there's a second option, which is pretty, pretty cool and simple, and it's sort of set it and forget it, at least for this kind of continuous, uh, continuous modem like we're building. And that's to use differential encoding. So, so how does that work? Well, instead of mapping the data onto phase, instead of mapping the data directly onto a plus or minus one, we're gonna map the data onto a phase shift. So this is easiest to, to demonstrate for uh, binary phase shift keying. So for, for BPSK, the idea of differential coding here is you start start in some, some particular state, some state, doesn't actually matter which state, maybe a zero. And if, if, you, if you want to send, send a zero, stay, stay in the state, And if you if you want to send send a one, switch states. So now we're sort of at the level of manipulating bits, which is a lot more computationally efficient and a lot easier to do. So let me run through an example of this, and then I'll I'll show how this works for more complicated encodings like QPSK. All right, let's do an example of this. So say my data that I wanted to transmit looks something like this. One, 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 zero, 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 one, zero. So this is my data. I'm gonna pass it through my differential encoder and that's what I'm gonna transmit, encoded. So here I start out with a state that doesn't turn out to matter, but I'll, I'll just say it's a zero. And I ask, if my data is a one, then I will flip this bit. So my data is a one, I will flip it. My data is a one again, I'll flip it. My data is a one again, so I'll flip it. 
to a one. And now I have a bunch of zeros, so I won't flip this. It'll just stay one, it'll stay one, and it'll stay one. Now my data is a one, so I'll flip this bit to a zero, and my data is a zero, and I'll just keep it at a zero. Okay, so that's my encoded version. That's what I transmit. Now I will receive this or a flip version. If I just receive this, let's go through the decoding process. Decoded. Well, for that, I have to look at two adjacent bits and ask the question, did they flip? So here the answer is yes, they did flip. So I'll put out a one. Did these flip? Yes, they did flip from one to a zero. So I'll put out a one. Did that flip? Yes. Did this flip? No. Did this flip? No, it's still a one. Did this flip? No, it's still a one. Did this flip? Yes. Went from one to a zero. Did this flip? No, they're the same. And you can see that my decoded version is the same as my encoded version. Now, let's say that we, uh, we locked onto the wrong phase. And what I actually received was an inverted version of what I transmitted. So I'll write that here, one, zero, one, zero, 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 one, one. Now, let me decode this. So again, I just asked the question, did the bit flip? And the answer here is yes, the bit flipped. Yes, the bit flipped. Yes, the bit flipped. No, it did not. No, it did not. No, it did not. Yes, the bit flipped. No, it did not. You can see that either way, I get back the same sequence, which was my input sequence. All right, so this will actually be where the homework comes in. Imagine that I encode this, this data and I transmit it out, but what I receive is a version with an error. So this is Rx with error. And so I get mostly the same thing back, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. And let's say that someplace random, like here, I get a bit flip error where I think I should, should have received a 1. But in fact, I got a 0. But the rest, the rest are the same. And the question is, decode this and see, see what happens to the original data. Now, this should give you a hint as to why, if you do have the ability to uh, lock on to the right one of the, uh, the phases, for example, in, uh, with packetized data where you're sending a unique word, that's often the preferred method. What you'll find here is that every error in the receiver gives you two errors when, after you decode it. You effectively increase your bit error rate by a factor of two. Okay, so, so how does this scheme work for, for something like QPSK? Well, first of all, you need a constellation that's numbered in a way where, where this can work. And the default ones in GNU Radio aren't necessarily numbered in that way. So you either have to rearrange the numbering or just start with a constellation where this, where this will work. And so let me just draw one that, that does work. So say this point down here is a zero and this point up here is, is a one. And this point up here has to be a two. So they have to be uh, increasing in either one way or the other, it doesn't matter, but they have to be continuous uh, as you go around the circle. And now, now let's say you wanted to transmit a one. So say you're starting in state number two and you want to transmit a one, well, you would go forward by one. So, uh, sorry, let me just say. So your data, data was a one, you would have transmitted a two and now you're transmitting a three. And let's say now your data is a two. Well, now you march forward two, two hops. So you go forward one, you're at zero. You go forward another one, you're at one. So if your data is a two, you would march forward two hops. Data is a two. And then say your data is a three. Uh, oh, and then you would transmit a one. If your data is a three, you would march forward three hops. So uh, let's go around the outside here to transmit a three. One, two, three. 
and the next thing you would actually spit out is a zero. Data is three. And of course, if your data is a zero, you would just stay right where you are. So on the receiver side, you just have to look at adjacent symbols that come in and ask how many, how many moves did I make? Keeping in mind that you know, going from three to zero counts as one move. And then you can decode what comes out the other side. So let me show you a flow graph where that's up and running. And I will show both methods. Okay, so here I'm, I'm starting with the same flow graph I had last time. And I'm basically gonna slowly reveal new items. So I have my simple sync block, my Costas loop block. I'm still plotting all of the debugging information from the Costas loop. And now, instead of just stopping there, I'm going to look at what happens. And in order to do that, I'm gonna send in some data that I can control. So how am I gonna do that? Well, I'm gonna send in a, a vector source rather than the random source. And if I look at my vector source, I'm gonna send in a, a pattern zero, one, two, three. So it goes zero, one, two, three, and then it bounces back and forth, zero, three, zero, three. So that'll be what we want to end up finding at the very end. And let me point out that in order to do this, I can't just use the default, oops, the default QPSK constellation. Um, that doesn't have the right ordering. I can instead make a variable constellation. And even that by default, when it comes up, doesn't have the right ordering. But if I number them zero, one, two, and three, if you look at the complex numbers here, they, they match the zero, one, two, and three that I drew. So zero is gonna be negative, negative. One is gonna be uh, negative real, but positive imaginary. Three is gonna be positive, positive. Uh, sorry, two is gonna be positive, positive, and three is gonna be positive, real, negative imaginary. So that's what I drew on the, on the board. So this constellation that's in this order allows us to do this uh, encoding and decoding properly. This is differential encoding and decoding. So um, let me first show what happens without the differential encoding and decoding. So you can choose to do that by setting the differential encoding here to be yes or no. Um, I'll, I'll start it out as no differential decoding. So on my Costas loop, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just look at what happens if I were to explicitly look at all four possible phase shifts. So I'm gonna multiply by one, which is basically e to the i zero degrees, multiply by the complex number i, which is a rotation by 90, multiply by minus one, which is a rotation by 180, and multiply by minus i, which is a rotation by 270. And then I'm gonna decode each of those four and turn them into floats and look at them on the time sink. So we're gonna look for the pattern that we saw. And if I play this, since everything is the same, the Costas loop should just lock. Now that I'm transmitting a fixed pattern here, the frequency spectrum does not have that nice flat appearance. We have peaks and, and troughs, and uh, you have to be a little bit careful because not the loops don't always lock. What I'm receiving really has some really sharp spikes because I'm basically sending the same thing over and over and over again. So sometimes some of these loops have trouble locking on really uh, short sequences that repeat a lot, but I think this one will probably work. Uh, let's go check. The Costas loop has, has locked, uh, which, and since it's on the unit circle, that means that the timing loop has also locked. And uh, what we're getting out can be decoded. And there are four options here. There's a zero degree phase rotation, which actually happens to be right in this case. We see this pattern. Let me stop it here. See zero, one, two, three, zero, three, zero, three. That's our correct pattern. And the others are rotated and decoded versions of those patterns, which don't, don't look much like the original pattern. So you'd have to, to, to try really hard to figure out what, what the mapping between those was. Let me see if I can get it to, uh, get it to lock on to a, a different phase. So let me just stop and basically play again. And now it's gonna come up in some other random phase. And nope, it still looks like it locked onto the zero phase. Let me try something else here. Uh, 
try it again. I moved the I moved the Pluto a little bit farther away here, so it's everything's a little bit noisier. I put it down in my lap instead of on the table. So now with all this extra noise, there are uh, the points aren't as sharply defined, um, and it probably took the loops a little bit longer to lock. And so now uh, the zero phase does not look like the pattern we're putting in. It turns out that a 90 degree phase now looks like the pattern we're putting in. I stop it, we go 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 3, 0, 3. So if you had a unique word in this data, which we do, you could just check all four of these and say which, which one of them repeats my unique word. And I will lock onto that at the start of the packet. And then from then on out, I can just ignore the other three and, and only decode the, the phase that is correct. So that's option number one, is to, to use a unique word and to check all four. Option number two is to use differential, differential encoding and decoding. And before I launch into the, the, the loop that does this, let me just show a little bit about uh, how, the, how the differential encoder and differential decoder work in GNU Radio. So there's, uh, there's a way of doing that that's built into the constellation modulator, which is turning on differential encoding. You can also just explicitly send it through a differential encoder. So I'll just show you what that looks like. I'll send my vector source through a differential encoder, a differential decoder, and I'll plot the original, the encoded, and the decoded version of my simple pattern that I put in. And we can ignore everything else because I'm just looking at this newest graph. So let me pause it here. In blue dots, those are my input bits. They're my familiar 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 3, 0, 3. My red is my differential encoded data. And uh, here uh, you, can, you can trace out, it's actually shifted one behind. So um, my data was a zero. And so I did not make a switch from here to here. My data was a one. So I did make a switch from here to here. My next data is going to be a two. So I actually bumped up two, one, two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can see how this uh, encoder works. And the output of my differential decoder is this green line, which connects all of the blue dots. So this, this process uh, can be done explicitly with the decoder and the encoder. Let me turn on my, my encoder and my constellation modulator. So I have to turn on differential encoding in my constellation modulator. And in order to use this, you need a constellation that has this nice property where if you rotate it by, by 90 degrees, you increment or decrement by one. And so uh, the default QPSK constellation does not have this property. You have to either remap the inputs or, or do something else with, with it. Uh, but you could set up a variable constellation and just explicitly type in the constellation that I had on the board. And this does have that property. So let me, let me play that. Uh, and let me also, before I play that, let me enable these blocks, which are the differential decoders. So after my constellation decoder, um, each of these four is going to have a different phase, but all of them should have the same sequence, and they should all map to the same, uh, the same encoded data. So I'm going to turn on all four of these and this time sync block with four inputs, and we're going to see that the, the decoded data are, are the same no matter what the, the offset is, and the decoded data should match our original data. So if I go down here, all right. So first of all, let me find my differential encoded data is this, is this red line, which kind of comes up and then slowly tapers down. I should find that in one of my cycles here. It happens to be the, the 270 degree phase shift. It kind of comes up and then slowly steps down. Um, but if I look at the bottom plot, this is my my uh, my decoded data, any of the four phase shifts end up decoding to the same sequence, and that is my input sequence. It goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 3, 0, 3. So this differential encoding and decoding is a nice way of not having to have a unique word and not having to, uh, to 
even think about this residual phase ambiguity. Uh, finally, I want to show what this looks like for more random looking data. So rather than having a, a specific pattern, I will turn on a random source. And I'm going to turn on a different random source. So I'm going to explain why, why I'm doing this. So uh, the random source by itself can have a repeat. So the number of samples, 512, this means it will draw 512 random numbers, 0, 1, 2, or 3, and it will repeat that over and over and over again. Why is this useful? Well, you get a nice random looking string, but it can repeat over and over again. So you can try to find that. And this is, uh, these are each two bits, right? 0, 1, 2, or 3 can be encoded in two bits. So I'm going to unpack those into, into two, uh, individual, two individual bytes. And I'm going to plot that on what's called a time raster sync. This is basically a picture. I'll show you what this looks like. So uh, there are, if there are 512 samples that are repeating over and over again, and I unpack each sample into two, two bits, then I have twice that. I have 1024 bits. And I will make my number of columns be 1024 and my number of rows in this picture be 64. So let me just, uh, let me show you what that looks like. I have to, since I turned on this random source, I have to turn off uh, this one or at least break this connection. And let me do the same thing down at the bottom. So I'm gonna send in my, this, these 512 symbols over and over and over again. And it doesn't matter which one of these I pick out because again, they were all the same, but I'll unpack those symbols and show them on the, the same kind of time raster sync. And let me play that and I'll go down to the bottom and I'll show you, show you what this looks like. This is a little bit more useful than sending in an extremely short sequence. So I've still got the, the, the Pluto in my, down in my lap. And so everything's a little bit more noisy. And if I look at my raster syncs, what you see here are uh, stripes. And what we get out isn't, it should be the same as what we get in, but it's going to be shifted by some by some arbitrary amount, depending on how long it took the transmitter to start up and lock on. And so what you have to do is you kind of have to look for patterns here. So there's a thick line and then these two, these two uh, medium lines. And it looks like that got shifted to over here, a thick line and these two medium lines. And so if you follow along, the what I'm getting out really is a shifted, kind of a shifted version of what I put in. And this is interesting. You could see bit errors here. So it looks like everything's coming through perfectly. Um, and we don't even see the, the, the scrolling happening. Let me take my transmitter power and turn it way down. So I'm going to take my transmitter attenuation and turn it up. And my receiver here, I'm getting, getting very few bits in my receiver. Let me just see if I've, I've locked properly. Yeah, it looks like I've still sort of locked. And it, now it's really noisy. We expect that some, some of these uh, points will cross the transition. And yeah, now you can see there's occasional errors. These stripes mostly look pretty good, but there are occasional little errors that, uh, that scroll up. Let me make the, the transmitter even weaker by turning up the attenuation even more. Now we're barely getting three different levels in our receiver. Uh, constellation looks better just because I'm moving around here. Our uh, and decoded bits are pretty good. Let me, let me bump this down even more here. Are we going to start to see bitters? Well, there were some errors when, when I was bumping it. Yeah, now you can finally start to see the occasional error scroll by. So even with a signal that's coming into my RTL SDR that looks really bad, right? This is what I'm actually receiving. It it barely flips one bit. Uh, well, it, it sort of flips one bit, and then occasionally it goes up to, to a couple other levels. But even with you know basically looking at four different levels, I can pretty accurately decode lots and lots of data with very few errors. We're basically done. Now, now you can do everything. So un understanding all the different building blocks that we've talked about, the, the multiplying by a spinning complex exponential, 
to shift in frequency. Um, what comes out of the SDR as a complex number, how the automatic gain control scales things so that all the further blocks can assume that the, the data happens roughly on the unit circle, uh, how the frequency locked loop, the, the scales, end up compensating for big frequency offsets, how even with some tiny residual frequency offset, the timing recovery can still find the right samples or interpolate to the right samples where the data passes through plus one or minus one, and how this costus, how the costus loop locks on uh, to get that final uh, fine phase correct. And finally, how you can use something like differential encoding to, uh, to avoid worrying about the, this overall uh, uh, kind of discrete phase ambiguities. Now you have all the tools you need to build uh, either a BPSK or a QPSK or a more complicated constellation modem. And next time what I'm going to do is I'm going to build the minimal modem and we're gonna to try to test it out in various different ways. I'm not gonna have time sinks and frequency sinks at every possible point. Uh, we're just gonna build the modem with the least number of, of blocks.